Hello everyone, welcome back to Physics 331. Um, so today we're going to start the last series of videos uh, and what we're going to try to do is to calculate the transient response of a transmission line. So that means what we want to know is how does say the voltage on a transmission line change with time or how does the current on a transmission line change with time. You could imagine a scenario where you have uh, a system in one equilibrium and then you change some property of the system and watch it evolve with time to a new equilibrium or a new steady state and so that's what's known as the transient response. Um, this is kind of a nice way to end things because what it's going to do it's it's going to bring together two of the major topics that we covered in physics 331. One is just transmission lines in general, and the second is uh, Fourier analysis. So if we think back first to our discussion of transmission lines, what we did is relatively early on in that analysis, we assumed that the voltage and current had a harmonic time dependence. And so these were signals that oscillated uh, sinusoidally with time. So relatively early on in the analysis of transmission lines, we assumed a harmonic time dependence. And when we made that assumption, what we end up with was a voltage that depended on position and time that was had the form of some amplitude times a harmonic time dependence. And the same sort of thing would be true for the current. So the time dependent current had a position dependent amplitude and a harmonic time dependence. Okay, what this allowed us to do is it simplified the analysis because we could then uh, solve for the Z dependence of the voltage and the current amplitude uh, by simplifying the set of differential equations we had and ending up with the wave equations. So this assumption allowed us to solve for the Z dependence, oh, sorry, Z dependence of V and I in the frequency domain. Uh, so what that means is that uh, the current and voltage amplitudes had a dependence on position, but there was also a dependence on frequency uh, involved in those expressions. Okay, so the question that we want to answer is, what if we want to analyze non-sinusoidal or non-harmonic signals in time. Okay, so for example, we might have a long transmission line and then we inject a pulse in one end and we look at the voltage at some point along the transmission line, what will happen? Uh, or what if we took a voltage and just went from zero and stepped instantaneous, instantaneously to some non-zero value? Um, and so these were both of the demonstrations that were given in the previous sets of videos that have been posted. So for example, a voltage 
pulse. So not something that oscillates, but something that just pulses up and then pulses back down right away. Uh, or a voltage step. Okay, and so our strategy is we can achieve this or we can do this using some of our results from the frequency domain analysis that we've already done of transmission lines. So from the frequency domain analysis of transmission lines, Uh, combined with an inverse Fourier transform and some of the properties that we learned about the inverse Fourier transform. So, for example, we'll see that uh, we're going to make use of the convolution theorem. Okay, so what I want to do is before we jump into this analysis, I just want to summarize results that we had from previous uh, videos that are going to be important for uh, today's analysis. So useful results. From previous videos. Okay, so first let's start with transmission lines. And I just want to remind you of the geometry that we adopted when we did our transmission line analysis. So um, what we imagined is that maybe we have some signal generator and that generator has an output impedance of ZG. So subscript G is for generator. So the generator provides voltage VG and has an output impedance of ZG. And then we connect that to a transmission line. And at the end of the transmission line, maybe we have some load impedance ZL. Okay, so the convention that we used is we set the position along the length of the transmission line. We use coordinate Z. And what we did is we said, we're gonna set Z equals zero to be the end of the transmission line where the load impedance ZL is. And the end connected to the generator was going to be at position Z equals minus L. And so the overall length of the transmission line is L. Um, that's not a geometry that we had to choose. We could have chosen to put the generator at Z equals zero and the load impedance at Z equals plus L, but that's not what we did, okay? Um, and so with this geometry, then what we have is that the voltage at the end of the transmission line connected to the generator is going to be the voltage at position Z equals minus L. And likewise, there's going to be a current at position Z equals minus L. And then at the load impedance, we have a voltage V at position Z equals zero and the current in our load impedance ZL is the current I at position Z equals zero. Okay, um, so that's the geometry and I think we'll come back to this figure but it's useful to have this in mind as we go through the analysis today. So we had some results. The voltage amplitude was a function of position and I'm also going to put explicitly a function of frequency in there, omega. And the result we had was that we had V plus with some coefficient. And then we had E to the minus J beta Z plus this gamma parameter, which remember was a reflection coefficient times E to the plus J beta Z. We also had solved for the current amplitude. And it had a similar form, this same V plus coefficient but this time it was divided by Z0, the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. 
and then we had e to the minus j beta z, and then we had a minus gamma e to the plus j beta z. You know, I've put in uh, frequency dependence to these expressions, but you know, if frequency doesn't explicitly appear on the right-hand side of these equal signs. So let me just remind you of a couple of things. So first, um, gamma was a reflection coefficient. And if you look back on our notes, we actually had two sets of coefficients. We had a V plus and also a V minus. But then we used the boundary condition at z equals zero to show that these were these two coefficients were related and they were related by this factor gamma, which is called the reflection coefficient. Uh, in fact, we could write down the expression for that reflection coefficient. It was ZL minus Z naught over ZL plus Z naught. Okay, the other thing I wanted to remind you of is that beta we had an expression for beta, and in fact, actually, our, our restriction on the form of beta came from the solution of the wave equation. And our requirement was that beta was equal to omega times the square root of the inductance per unit length and capacitance per unit length of the transmission line. And in fact, the square root of the inductance per unit length times the capacitance per unit length was actually equal to the inverse of the propagation speed. And so we're using S for propagation speed. I don't want to use V because that would be confusing with voltage. So this is propagation speed. So there you can see why then I could write that these this voltage and current amplitude are, are functions of frequency omega. And it's because omega appears in these beta factors. Okay, um, because we're going to be doing some inverse Fourier transforms eventually, I want to write this in terms of you know a notation that we might have used when discussing Fourier transforms, and the notation that we used for signals in the frequency domain was a little hat over the variable. So a voltage in the frequency domain would be V hat, and we could write in explicitly that this depends on position and frequency, and a current would be an I hat, and it depends on position and frequency. Okay, good. So that's, that's a little quick summary of some transmission line results that will be useful. And the other thing we're gonna make use of today are inverse Fourier transforms. Um, so the definition of the inverse Fourier transform was that if big F inverse means the inverse Fourier transform, if we apply that to a function F hat of omega, so a function that has some frequency dependence, then what we get, the result is a function in the time domain. In the time domain. Okay, and so the definition of this inverse Fourier transform was a one over two pi, the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the function of omega, f hat, times e to the j omega t integrated over frequency. Okay, so that's one result. Um, there's a couple other useful things that we encountered. One was a definition of the delta function, or maybe not a definition, but maybe a way to mathematically express the delta function. And what that looked like was one over two pi, the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of e to the j t minus t naught times omega integrated over frequency. And that was one way of expressing delta of t minus t naught. And so this is something we'll encounter. And finally, the other thing I want to remind you of is the convolution theorem.
The convolution theorem was useful when you take when you want to take the inverse Fourier transform, for example, of the product of two functions of frequency. So suppose I had an x1 of omega times an x2 of omega, and then I want to take the inverse Fourier transform of that product. Well, what the convolution theorem says is that's equal to the convolution of x1 of t and x2 of t. And so that was just a fancy notation for the following integral. So the inverse Fourier transform of a product of two functions of omega is equal to the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of x1 of tau times x2 of t minus tau integrated over tau. And so that's one other thing that we'll make use of today. Okay, good. And so those are all the all the different properties that we'll try to uh, see if we can use to solve this problem of finding the transient response on a transmission line. So uh, just to start, I want to note that the analysis that we're going to present today is based on a paper from 1969 and the author was Aitken and the paper is called a Fourier transform approach to transmission line analysis. Okay, and so if you happen to go look up this paper, uh, one thing that's important to note is that the geometry that they use in, in that paper is not the one that I have drawn here. They choose to set z equals zero at the end of the transmission line connected to the function generator and z equals plus l at the load impedance. So in the analysis that I'm going to present, I've modified what is shown in the paper so that it applies to the geometry that we have been using. Okay, so from the figure, let's label it figure one. So let's look at figure one here. Transmission lines, and so here's figure one. Um, what I want to do is I want to write down a Kirchhoff voltage loop rule. And so what we can do is we can start here, and let's just do a little inside loop. And so the first thing we do is we cross the function generator, so we get the generator voltage. And then we're going to cross the uh, generator impedance Zg, which has current I minus L through it. So we're going to drop a voltage of Zg, Zg times, Z, uh, times I at minus L. And that must be equal to the voltage at the input of the transmission line, which is V at Z equals minus L. Okay, and so if we write down that expression, we would require that using the Fourier kind of notation with the Z hats for the frequency domain signals, the generator voltage minus the current at Z equals minus L times the generator impedance has to be equal to the voltage at the input of the transmission line, which is at Z equals minus L. So this is a little Kirchhoff loop. And really what this corresponds to is a boundary condition on our problem at Z equals minus L. Okay, 
Um, but what's nice about the I hat and the V hat is that we have some expressions for these things. And so all we're gonna do is take these expressions and substitute in uh, Z is equal to minus L. And at the same time, we'll substitute in beta is equal to omega divided by S. And so if we do that for both the voltage V hat and the current I hat, what we'll end up with is, uh, so there's nothing we're gonna do with the generator voltage. So that's just uh, VG hat. Uh, but then we're gonna minus the I hat, but the I hat was V plus over Z naught. And then it was E to the minus j beta z but we're going to put in z equals minus l so we'll get uh, e to the plus j and for beta we're going to put in an l over s and then we have a minus gamma for the current e to the minus j omega l over s that has to multiply the impedance the output impedance of the generator and all of that then is equal to the voltage V hat at minus L. And so that is equal to V plus E to the J omega L over S. Uh, and then instead of a minus gamma, it's a plus gamma E to the minus J omega L over S. Okay, so what I wanna do with this is, you know, the V plus coefficient is Kind of right now this unknown coefficient so i want to solve for the v plus coefficient uh, so we'll do that in a couple steps um, vg hat is equal to let's move uh, all the terms with v plus over to the right hand side and then factor out the v plus so uh, first we'll deal with the term that was already there on the right hand side That was the V hat terms. And then what we have left over is the ratio of these impedances ZG divided by Z0. So we get uh, plus ZG over Z0. And then uh, everything that was in the brackets, E to the J omega L over S minus gamma E to the minus J omega L over S. Oh, let me, let me rewrite this so that it all fits. I think we can make this look a bit nicer. So it's plus gamma E to the minus J omega L over S. And then it's plus uh, ZG over Z naught E to the J omega L over S minus gamma E to the minus J omega L over S. And then we have to close both brackets. Okay. So then finally, if I want an expression for this coefficient V plus, I'm just gonna divide by everything that's in the square brackets. And so it's a big long expression that we'll just rewrite ZG over Z naught E to the J omega L over S minus gamma E to the minus J omega L over S. Okay, and so that's, that's our result for this coefficient. It's you know, admittedly, it's a long, complicated result. Um, so what we're gonna do for our analysis is to simplify things, we're gonna consider a special case. Uh, so we now consider the special case in which the output impedance of the function generator ZG is equal to 
the characteristic impedance Z0 of the transmission line. So let's just write that in words. The output impedance of the generator is matched to the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. Um, one of the reasons we're considering this case is um, that it will make the it will simplify this expression considerably, as we'll see in just a moment. But another reason why we're considering this case is because it's commonly true. Uh, if you're designing an experiment that you're using to uh, operate at high frequencies, you often will, um, well, in fact, you'll almost always use a function generator that has an output impedance that is usually 50 ohms, and you'll connect that to a transmission line, a coaxial cable that has a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms, okay? Um, so if it is true that Zg and Z0 are equal to each other, then this would become a one, and then we would have a gamma e to the minus j omega l over s minus a gamma e to the minus e to the minus j omega l over s, and those terms would just cancel completely. Um, and if you have that cancellation, then you would get that V plus would be equal to VG hat. And then you'd have a E to the J omega LS plus E to the J omega uh, L over S. So you'd have two of those. So you'd get a VG hat over two. And then if we bring that exponential up to the numerator, we'd get E to the minus J omega L over S. Okay, and so this is the result for this uh, B plus coefficient for our special case where we have this impedance matching condition with the generator and transmission line. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to go back to this expression for V hat of Z and omega we're gonna sub in the value that we just got for V plus, and we're gonna set Z equal to minus L. So let's do all of that. Okay, so for this special case, the voltage at the transmission line input in the frequency domain is um, so instead of writing V hat at Z equals minus L all the time I'm just going to define that to be V in so what V in is going to mean is the voltage at the input of the transmission line, which is uh, the position Z equals minus L. Um, okay, so V in hat is going to be, if you go back to that very first expression, it was a V plus, and then it was E to the minus J omega uh, times beta. Sorry, it was e to the minus j beta times z, but we put z equals minus l, so we get e to the plus j, and beta is omega over s, and so we can write it like this, plus gamma e to the minus j omega l over s. Okay, good. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take our new expression for v plus and put it right there. And so we'll get a VG hat over two. And then the exponential that we multiply through 
is going to cancel with the first exponential. So we'll get a 1 plus, and then gamma times e to the minus j omega ls times e to the minus j omega ls will be gamma times e to the minus 2j omega l over s. And I'm going to call this, uh, let's call it number sign. So this is one of our first important results. So what we want to do then is say, well, suppose we set up an experiment where we use an oscilloscope to measure the voltage at the input of the transmission. Suppose we measure the voltage at the transmission line input in the time domain using an oscilloscope. So the question is, what do we expect to get? Right, all these expressions here, uh, like equation number sign, these are all for the frequency domain, right? All our voltages have little hats on them. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this expression, uh, which I've labeled as number sign, and we're going to apply the inverse Fourier transform to take these frequency domain signals and move them into the time domain. Okay, so let's just draw a picture of what we're imagining. Now we have uh, our signal generator with output impedance ZG and then we have our input to our transmission line and we're going to get a oscilloscope and we're going to measure that voltage and then we have our long transmission line and then it's terminated with some load impedance ZL. Okay, so as I said the the approach is to take the inverse inverse Fourier transform of this expression number sign to get the input voltage in the time domain. Okay, so mathematically then, Vn of t is equal to the inverse Fourier transform of V hat, V in hat of omega. And we have an expression for V in hat. It's equal to uh, Vg hat over two, one plus gamma, e to the minus 2j omega l over s. And maybe you can already start to see what's going to happen here is we have a vg hat, so the generator voltage in the frequency domain, multiplying another function that involves frequency. Uh, so our frequency dependence is in the e to the minus 2j omega l over s, so the omega there. And so we have a product of two frequency dependent functions, and we're going to take the inverse Fourier transform of that product, and that means we are going to make use of this convolution theorem. Okay, um, but let's just be a little careful here first. Uh, let's say to see how this works. Let's assume that gamma, our reflection coefficient, which remember is ZL minus Z naught over ZL plus Z naught is frequency independent. And that is an assumption because, uh, you know, if your if your load impedance at L was 
made with either an inductor or a capacitor or some combination of those things, then the impedance of an inductor and a capacitor are frequency dependent, right? The impedance of an inductor is J omega times L, and the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over J omega times C. So let's assume that that's not the case, and we can assume that gamma is frequency independent. Basically, that means uh, ZL is like some resistance. It could be 50 ohms or 10 ohms or 1,000 ohms or whatever, but it has no frequency dependence. Okay, well, let's see then. Uh, v in of T is going to be equal to... So first, we have uh, Vg over 2 times 1, and then it's plus something. So the, the inverse Fourier transform can be... is it has a distributive property. So the inverse Fourier transform of A plus B is equal to the inverse Fourier transform of A plus the inverse Fourier transform of B. So let's make use of that property. So uh, first the one half is independent of uh, frequency so we can factor it out and so we would have one half of the inverse Fourier transform of VG hat and then we have plus and so let's see, we, we're going to assume gamma is frequency independent, so it can come out, and there's still a factor of 1 half, we'll take that out. And then we have the inverse Fourier transform of, well, what's left? We have a VG hat, and it's multiplying this exponential, e to the minus 2j omega L over s. Okay. So let's make a few notes here. One is easy. So this is just the inverse Fourier transform of the signal generator's output in the uh, frequency domain. Well, the result is just the signal generator output in the time domain. We don't even have to write down what the inverse Fourier transform looks like, like the, the actual integral. We just know that that's going to be the result. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can notice that this is of the form of like some function of frequency x1 hat times some other function of frequency x2 hat. And we know that if we take the inverse Fourier transform of a product of functions of frequency is we get the convolution of the functions of time. So this would be Vg of t convolved with whatever the inverse Fourier transform of this other function is, e to the minus 2j omega l over s. All right. Good. So Let's make a couple notes. Note one. Um, first, let's let's deal with this inverse Fourier transform of that exponential function. In this case, we will write down the actual integral of the inverse Fourier transform. It's one over two pi, integral from minus infinity to infinity, and then we have our function e to the minus two j omega l over s. And then for the inverse Fourier transform, we multiply by e to the j omega t, and then we integrate over frequency. Okay, so we can combine these two exponentials, and we get e to the, let's see, they both have a j, and then I'm gonna write it this way. I'm gonna put the t from the second uh, exponential, and then we have a minus two L over S from the first exponential and then we can factor out an omega for both of them and then D omega. And so if you look back way back at the beginning one of the things that we reminded ourselves of sorry I passed it is right here the definition of a delta function. So our results that we just wrote down is exactly equivalent to this definition of the delta function if we set t naught to be equal to 2l over s. 
And so this whole thing is the delta function of t minus 2l over s. And that's very nice because we still have to deal with the convolution and uh, the fact that one of our functions of time is going to be a delta function is going to make evaluating that convolution integral very straightforward. Which brings us to our second note. So we're trying to deal with this vg of t convolved with the inverse Fourier transform of this exponential. But we just showed that this inverse Fourier transform is the delta function. And so this is vg of t convolved with delta t minus 2l over s. And we know how to evaluate these convolutions. It's the integral from minus infinity to infinity of bg of tau times delta of whatever it was, the t minus 2l over s minus tau, and then we integrate over tau. But of course, we know that the integral of some function of t times delta of t minus t naught, if we integrate over all of time, then what we get is that we just get the first function evaluated at the time t naught. And so we can apply that rule and the result is just vg where tau is going to be replaced with t minus 2l over s. Okay, good. So that's a pretty kind of tidy result. And what we can do is we can combine all of these things and we can write down our final expression for v n of t. So v n of t is equal to uh, v g of t over two was the first result. And then we get plus gamma over two and whatever this convolution was, which we just evaluated, so it's plus gamma over 2 times Vg of t minus 2 L over s. And that's it. So that's the big result. Um, we can interpret these two terms. The first term, this Vg of t, is just the signal generator output. I mean, that makes sense, right? Because uh, in our geometry, what we've calculated is the voltage at the input of the transmission line. And in our geometry, the input of the transmission line is right at the output of the function generator. So whatever happens at the function generator output, this V of G of T, it has to also appear at this input of the uh, transmission line. But then we get a second term. And the second term is also the signal output from the function generator, but it's shifted in time. It's delayed by a time of 2L over S. And in addition to being delayed, it is scaled by the factor gamma over two, which is the gamma is the reflection coefficient. And so the second term is the signal generator output scaled by gamma over 2 and delayed by a time of 2L over S. And if you think of this time 2L over S, if you have a transmission line of length L and the signal is propagating at speed S, then L over S is the time for the signal to travel the length of the transmission line. 2L over S is the time for the signal to travel the length of the transmission line, reflect 
from the far end at the load impedance ZL and then travel back to the input. And so this delay of 2L over S corresponds to the time for the signal to travel to the end of the transmission line and back. Um, you know, you can you can do you can do some interesting checks. One is you can say, well, what if the load impedance ZL is matched to the characteristic impedance of the transmission line? In that case, we expect uh, gamma, the reflection coefficient, to be zero. And then in that case, V in is just equal to VG over two. So we get only the output of the function generator and the load impedance is going to absorb all of the signal with no reflection. And so we don't get that delayed pulse back at the end. Okay, so we could, I'll just finish off by sketching a couple of the possibilities. And so let's start on a new fresh page. So example, ZL is say goes to infinity. And so that corresponds to an open circuit. So no load impedance directly connected to the output, we just leave it open. And so that acts like a impedance of infinity. So the reflection coefficient is ZL minus Z naught over ZL plus Z naught. If we make ZL much bigger than Z naught, then we approximately get just ZL over ZL, which is just one. Okay, in that case, if gamma is just one, then we have VG over two plus VG of T minus two L over S over two. And so the result is just one half of VG of T plus VG of T minus two L over S. And so let's suppose that the output of our function generator is a square pulse. For a square pulse, Uh, let's say for a square pulse uh, of height v naught, then what would we be looking at? Here's time, and so let's say this is the voltage at the input of the transmission line. Then what we would get is the initial pulse due to the output of the function generator. And so because of that factor of one half, that pulse height will be at the input of the function generator will be V naught over two. And let's say this is time t equals zero. So the pulse starts at time t equals zero. And then what will happen is as we wait, we'll see a second pulse appear. And that second pulse appears at the same height and it's delayed by a time of 2L over S. And so that's due to traveling the length of the transmission line, the first pulse, reflecting off the open circuit and coming back to the input of the transmission line. And so this is the signal that we demonstrated in one of the uh, videos from the previous set. Okay, um, we'll do one more example to finish off. Suppose we set the load impedance ZL to be equal to zero. And so that corresponds to a short circuit. So if we had a coaxial transmission line, we would just connect the inner conductor directly to the outer conductor with a short wire, for example. Well, in that case, gamma is ZL minus Z naught divided by ZL plus Z naught. If you set ZL equal to zero, then you get a minus one you get minus uh, Z naught divided by plus Z naught. Okay, and our expression for V in of T is exactly the same as the previous case, except for a minus sign between the two terms. 
And in that case, if we drew a plot of what we would expect, this is going to be Vn of t. And so now I'm going to draw uh, V0 over 2 and a minus V0 over 2. So first, we'll get the pulse output by the function generator. That will occur at, say, time t equals 0, if that's when the pulse is output. And then we wait a certain amount of time. The pulse will reappear, but it will be inverted. That's because the reflection coefficient was minus 1. And that is going to be delayed by the same amount of time. 2L over S, the time for the signal to travel the length of the transmission line twice there to the end and then back again. Okay, good. So thanks very much. That's where I'm going to stop for today. I think I'll do one more video probably where I can show you how you could plot some of these uh, responses uh, mathematically in Python, but, but that's probably going to be it. So um, uh, I'll see you next time for probably one more short video. Thanks.